Okay, we will get started. Hello and welcome to the fall 2021 Johns Hopkins Master of Arts in Science Writing Thesis Reading. Greetings to all students, faculty, and friends, and family members. Thank you for joining us. My name is Melissa Hendricks, and I am the Associate Director of the Hopkins Science Writing Program, and I will be leading us through today's proceedings. And I'm so pleased, and my dog friend is pleased as well, as you can hear, um, I'm so pleased to have this honor because our fall and spring thesis readings are such special events and they are the culmination and the celebration of our students' hard work in our master's program. For those of you who may not be familiar with our work, the Hopkins Science Writing Program began as a concentration in the Hopkins Master of Arts in Writing Program back in the early 90s, last century. And for almost 30 years, aspiring science journalists, essayists, memoirists, and book authors have sought out the program to hone their skills. The program has seen many changes over the years. Initially, of course, classes were held in physical classrooms, if you can remember those, and students turned in actual paper papers for their assignments. Students came only from the DMV, the DC, Maryland, and Virginia area. And now most classes are online and students attend from places as far away as California and Canada, Florida and Michigan, Australia and Ireland. And electronic formats, of course, have replaced almost all paper papers. But one element of the curriculum has not changed. Early on, the founders of the writing program declared that students should culminate their studies by submitting a master's thesis, which for us is a portfolio of a student's best writing. And we continue that tradition today. Students devote an entire semester to the task of revising and editing selected works and often submit some of their works for publication in literary journals, newspapers or science magazines. This term is devoted entirely to revision and affords students a chance to delve more deeply into their subjects, to sharpen their prose, and to elevate their writing from competent to excellent or even exceptional. 15 writers tonight will share a portion of their thesis work with us. And I'm so pleased to say that every piece this evening has achieved that apex of excellent. Several of today's stories and essays plumb deep issues involving life and death and questions of personal health and autonomy. We'll hear a variety of environmental stories which take us to different locations, but interesting to me, all unite around the same question of how does, do we find hope amidst the planet's ecological ruin? And in tonight's readings, we'll also meet a lot of non-human critters, birds and bees, muskrats and nematodes, and some dandelions too. And just a special note that some of these selections discuss difficult topics, our students have the freedom to write on the subjects that matter to them, and sometimes students choose to tackle personally tough subjects, and we applaud them for their courage in doing so. So tonight we are going to hear from 15 readers. About halfway through, we'll have a short uh, intermission, and then at the end, please stick around because uh, we will have a special announcement um, uh, to announce the recipients of our student award named in honor of our former program director, David Everett. But before we begin, I'd like to um, say a thanks to some very important people. And the first person I would like to thank and also to introduce is Sam Apple. Sam is our faculty program coordinator and an incomparable faculty member. 
and Sam will say a few words before we move on. Hi, I just wanted to very quickly add my own congratulations to all of our student readers tonight. Uh, I've been the program coordinator for a little bit more than a year now, and this is the first time I'm attending this event after having worked with um, a number of these students, and it's really just a great honor uh, to have worked with these students and, and to see how their work has improved over the past semesters. And um, I'm excited to hear from the students I haven't worked with yet, but really just so pleased to be a part of this. So congrats again. And I should also add that Sam will be teaching the thesis class. Uh, we'll be one of two instructors teaching thesis next semester. Um, and I know a lot of folks are really looking forward to that. Um, the, the second person I would like to acknowledge and thank is the faculty member who is teaching the thesis class this semester, along with me, the incomparable Sue Eisenfeld, um, who is a long serving and incredibly dedicated faculty member. Sue, thank you for all that you do for the program. And I would also like to recognize all of our exceptional faculty and thesis advisors. I just uh, continually um, uh, am amazed and inspired by your dedication and your talent and your generosity with your time. Thank you all for what you do for us students. Um, also a loud shout out to Karen Hooper, director of the writing programs and also a wonderful faculty member in her own right. Um, then on my list, and this is in no special order, but this next group um, are very important people uh, who deserve a special thanks. And those are the partners and spouses, the parents and children and friends of our thesis students. Um, those folks who have stood by and cheered on our students during um, their long nights and days in this program, thank you for believing in the work of these students and for encouraging them to pursue their passion for writing. And then finally, I would like to thank the stars of today's event, our thesis readers and all of our thesis students. You continue to impress me with your intelligence, your creativity, and your dedication to science communication. It's truly been an honor and a privilege to work with you. So now on to our proceedings. I will be introducing our first reader, um, and then um, that person will introduce the next reader and so on. As I mentioned, halfway through, we'll take a five minute intermission and um, then return for more readings. And then at the very end, we will announce um, the recipient of our very special award in honor of David Everett. So I am proud to introduce our first reader, T. Callahan who is joining us from his home in Chicago and who will read from his thesis work, The Nose Knows Best. T? Hi there. Thanks everybody for taking the time to join us tonight and quick special shout out to my thesis advisor, Kim O'Connell for her patience and uh, deliberate feedback throughout the uh, revision process. So this is a blog entry on the benefits of nasal breathing. Um, as it relates to uh, endurance sports and overall health. In, out, in, out, in, out. Good. Now let's talk about breathing. If you're reading this, you've been breathing on your own, hopefully, since the minute you were born. Inherently simple, it is one of several unconscious, unconscious processes that keeps us alive from one moment to the next. But just because the act in and of itself is simple, the results of each breath are anything but. Despite the capacity to breathe through either our nose or mouth, the one we choose matters a great deal. Anatomically speaking, our nose is designed for breathing and our mouth for eating, drinking, and well, speaking. However, some estimates say that as many as 30 to 50% of adults regularly breathe through their mouth. Quite simply, 
This is not what nature intended. A breath inhaled through the mouth cannot compare to that same breath through our nose. Whether training for endurance sports or simply striving to live a healthier life, there is no shortage of advantages to nasal breathing. It warms, moistens, and filters the air we breathe while helping to prevent colds and flus and promotes activity of the parasympathetic nervous system, basically helping to calm our bodies. What might set nasal breathing apart from the mouth most though is nitric oxide. Discovered in 1998, nitric oxide is a signaling molecule in our cardiovascular system, a powerful bronco and vasodilator. It lowers blood pressure and particularly relevant to endurance performance, increases our lungs ability to absorb the oxygen contained in each breath we take. Not only is oxygen more readily absorbed by the lungs when we breathe through our nose, each breath actually contains more oxygen. Thanks in part to intricately dense nasal passages, the nose provides more resistance to the airstream than the mouth. This resistance encourages elasticity in the lungs and results in upwards of nearly 20% more oxygen with each breath. Important as oxygen is, it is far from alone after. Unfairly labeled a waste product, carbon dioxide often gets a bad rap to be exhaled with reckless abandon. In fact, carbon dioxide is instrumental in regulating many important functions associated with one's endurance, namely the release of oxygen to our tissues. Our lungs require about 5% carbon dioxide. Given our atmosphere contains only a fraction of this, 0.03% exact, our bodies are responsible for producing and storing enough in the blood and lungs to make up that difference. Known as the carbon dioxide partial pressure, this delicate balancing act helps regulate the amount of oxygen in our blood. The oxygen in our blood is transported attached to the protein called hemoglobin. As the carbon dioxide partial, partial pressure rises, the bond between oxygen and hemoglobin weakens, making oxygen more readily available to be absorbed by our muscles and tissue. Alternatively, reducing that carbon dioxide partial pressure only strengthens the bond which results in less oxygen being available throughout the body. Every athlete is beholden to this system. So the question that arises, does it matter how we exhale? We know a breath through the nose contains more oxygen than the same breath taken through the mouth. Similarly, each exhale through the mouth releases more carbon dioxide, lowering that partial pressure. It then follows that during peak output, while huffing and puffing with mouths agape, we are in effect making it only making it more difficult for oxygen to reach our muscles. Consider then the effect that our breathing has on our VO2 max. The term VO2 max gets thrown around a lot in sport and is a crucial metric for maintaining one's endurance. It's something of a nebulous concept, even to those familiar with the term. An athlete's VO2 max is the aerobic capacity of our muscles, a measure of the maximum performance level before our muscles begin using oxygen faster than the blood can restore it. So if we are regularly breathing through our mouths while training, we are in effect inhaling less oxygen while exhaling more carbon dioxide at a rate that only makes the oxygen we do receive less bioavailable. Along with the direct relationship nasal breathing has on one's endurance, the benefits extend into daily life. In an article published in Nursing and General Practice, Dr. Alan Ruth outlined the many ways in which our nose plays an instrumental role in maintaining our overall health, including antiviral benefits of, nitric, of the nitric oxide produced in our nose. Alternatively, mouth breathing allows for larger particulate matter to enter the body, avoiding many of the natural obstacles our sinuses provide. So as Dr. Ruth put it, if more of us took time to invest in the regular, in, in regular nose breathing, we would see a decrease in healthcare expenses and begin to see a healthier population. Now, take another deep breath, but this time through your nose. Thank you. And next, I'd like to introduce Stephanie Desmond, who will be reading Your Baby is Very Sick. Thank you, Taylor. Um, this piece was published in the Washington Post on November 30th. Women don't often talk about their abortions. It's understood to be a secret and a shameful one. Time has done little to make it more acceptable. Polls show more support for legal abortion than at any time since the early 1990s, but there is still stigma attached to it. It's 2021 
and things seem more dire than they have been in my lifetime. The Supreme Court ruling that made abortion legal in 1973, Roe v. Wade, is teetering. This month, the Supreme Court heard arguments on a Texas law that essentially prohibits abortions after six weeks, two weeks after a missed period, and will soon cause We'll soon hear a case about a Mississippi law which bans most abortions after 15 weeks. Lawmakers in red states are doing everything they can to get, make getting an abortion as difficult as legally possible. It's desperation time. One in four women will have an abortion before the age of 45, according to the Guttmacher Institute. We need to start telling our stories. This is mine. The first sign of trouble in my pregnancy came on a Sunday morning in November 2005 when I drove myself 16 weeks along and bleeding to the emergency room. Nothing to worry about, they told me as they measured this and poked that. But that Tuesday, well into my second trimester, I was still bleeding and my obstetrician dispatched me to downtown Baltimore for a second opinion because she knew it was absolutely something to worry about. The ultrasound technician there proceeded as if on autopilot, rolling the wand back and forth across the sticky gel on my stomach. There's the head, she announced, pointing to the big ball that dominated the pixel I nodded, taking her word for it. I almost need along to pretend everything was normal, just as she was doing. But this was no routine visit. Something was terribly wrong with my child. Your baby is very sick, the second opinion doctor finally told me. My son would not be born alive. He lacked a kidney and a limb, his heart malformed, most probably because of a chromosomal abnormality. The doctor gave me two choices. I could wait for my baby's heart to stop, and it would, though it might take weeks or longer, or I could terminate the pregnancy sooner. An abortion, he eventually said, when it was clear I had no idea what he was talking about. Choices was a funny way to put it. On the morning of my diagnosis 16 years ago, the doctor told me he couldn't perform that abortion. My obstetrician told me her hospital wouldn't allow her to either. Both said the hospitals they were affiliated with did not have the equipment to handle second trimester abortions. As I walked out, the receptionist handed me a business card. On it, the phone number for Planned Parenthood, the only, the only place, place in Maryland where I could terminate a second trimester pregnancy at that time, she told me. In Maryland, one of a handful of states explicitly protecting reproductive rights in state law, second trimester abortions are rare and difficult to get, I would learn. Planned Parenthood offered me an appointment, but not for two weeks. I'd made what could be seen as my choice, but how could I wait two weeks, carrying my son's broken body, him feeding off me, dying bit by bit, knowing I would never meet him. Calling my boss, I told him I needed time off. How could I wake up every morning pretending everything was fine when it was not? How could I face the coworkers and friends who knew I was pregnant, but not that I soon would not be? I had never imagined I would want two children, but after my first child, a boy was born, I yearned for the second baby. I'd made room in my you can have it all right now life with a delightful toddler, working the job I'd always wanted as a newspaper reporter and living in a quaint pre-war house with original subway tiles and the upstairs bath. At four months along with this pregnancy, completing my little family seemed within reach. Two days after seeing the second opinion doctor, I'd be heading to my parents' place near Buffalo for Thanksgiving. My mother took charge. In her grief, she called everyone she could think of finding an appointment at an abortion clinic near her house for that Friday, just three days away. I cried, both with the relief of knowing I needed to wait only a little longer and with the heavy realization, I wouldn't deliver this baby that I wanted so much. On Friday, she cooked turkey and corn pudding. On Friday, she held my toddler on her hip and waved goodbye as I headed for the clinic. Now I'd like to introduce Lori Baird. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, let's see, I'm going to dive right in. Every two years they assemble, almost 2000 of them, almost always in LA, always for five days. They come from around the world, Australia and Austria, India and Ireland, Pakistan and Puerto Rico, the United Arab Emirates and Uruguay. They gather to celebrate the object of their passion. Every day during the, the event, Fans participate in talks and roundtable discussions and workshops all about their hero. Socials and parties, even a variety show fill out the evenings. And all of it is in honor of a worm. 
This is the Genetic Society of America International C. Elegans Conference, WormCon, if you will, the largest scientific meeting in the world devoted to research about a little worm whose scientific name is Cenoraptitis elegans or C. elegans. But in perhaps the way Sherlock Holmes refers to Irene Adler as the woman, C. elegans is known to those in biological research, research as the worm. Scientists don't just value the worm, they adore it, and they're not afraid to show it. Shop around and you'll find I Break for C. elegans or Wild About Worms t-shirts, as well as C. elegans earrings, cookie cutters, fine art prints, notepads, plushies, and tie clips. Most of us would probably consider this worm pretty unspectacular. Barely visible to the naked eye, it's a common roundworm or nematode that lives in temperate soil and compost in most of the world. But around this wee worm has grown an entire universe. Worldwide, more than 1,000 labs and many millions of dollars in funding are dedicated to learning about it. The worm has been the research focus of five Nobel laureates and more than 15,000 scientific papers in the last five years alone, making it a very big deal in biochemistry, genetics, genomics, immunology, microbiology, molecular biology, neuroscience, and pharmacology, pharmacology to name only a few. In fact, over the last 50 years, this tiny creature has enhanced our knowledge and understanding of how we develop from a single cell, grow, age, become ill, and die. The attention scientists lavish on the worm is largely due to its being a near ideal model organism. Model organisms or model systems are species much simpler than humans that researchers study to discover how certain biological processes such as heredity or aging work. Ideally, research on a model organism yields insights into how those processes work in humans, but that requires the right model organism for the job. And for many scientists, that means C. elegans. The reasons why the worm is an optimal model organism range from the mundane to the remarkable. Debesmita Roy worked with the worm during her postdoc days in the Hubbard lab at NYU School of Medicine. Her eyes gleam as she explains why she likes C. elegans. They're safe and easy to handle, says Roy, and they can't make you sick. That's a luxury not afforded to infectious disease researchers. And unlike higher organisms like mice, they're small and inexpensive, so we can culture them in very large numbers. But those large numbers don't eat up a lot of lab space. You can have hundreds of thousands of worms in a small area, says Roy, and that's a good thing because C. elegans reproduces fast. There are two sexes, hermaphrodite, which is a female that can self-fertilize, and a male. A single hermaphrodite can give birth to 300 progeny over the course of her 14-day life. If she mates with a male, that number skyrockets to 1,400. Few organisms, with or without backbones, can match C. elegans for toughness. For one thing, their larva can be frozen indefinitely. Back in 2017, Greg Stegman was a postdoc in the Department of Zoology at the University of British Columbia. He recounts the time he and his colleagues thawed some worms from 1989. They were animals my supervisor froze after a project, he says. We revived them, and for a few days, I got to work with worms that were almost as old as me. They were fine, he says brightly. Uh, that was from a piece in my thesis called The Worm. And now I would like to introduce Lisa Turner. Thanks, Lori. I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in. On a Tuesday night in mid-March 2008, I drank an entire bottle of vodka. Less than a week later, I voluntarily checked in to Yale Psychiatric Hospital. I had been struggling with depression for months and lying to my therapist and psychiatrist about how much I was drinking. I knew alcoholism had affected members on both sides of my family. While in the hospital, I was diagnosed with alcohol use disorder or AUD. AUD is a chronic relapsing brain disorder in which one has an impaired ability to stop or control alcohol use despite adverse consequences. My adverse consequences could have been worse. I drove drunk all the time, but never got a DUI. I still had my job as a neuroscience graduate student. I hadn't lost any friends. 
but I had been in a truly awful on and off relationship with another alcoholic for more than two years. I was going deeper into credit card debt to fund my drinking habit. And most nights I went out, I would wake up at home with no memory of how I had gotten there. As much as I fought the label of alcoholic, I had been dancing around it for months. What problem drinker hasn't Googled, am I an alcoholic? In a moment of weakness while hungover after yet another night of drinking too much. To be diagnosed with AUD, an individual must meet at least two of 11 criteria from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. I met 10. Once I received my official diagnosis, I knew I had to quit drinking. But it's easy to make that choice in the relative safety of a psychiatric hospital. You don't have a choice. You have no access to alcohol. But what happens once you leave that bubble? There has been a lot of research on the ways in which AUD affects the brain. Chronic alcohol intake is associated with changes in brain activity in areas of the brain known to be involved in stress and reward. These changes interfere with emotion processing, stress regulation, and cognition. They are also associated with high alcohol craving, which can lead to continued heavy drinking and high relapse risk after treatment. The first few weeks and months after the onset of sobriety are the most precarious. More than 35% of AUD patients that enter outpatient treatment relapse within 30 days. Greater than 65% relapse within 90 days. After a week and a half in the psychiatric hospital, I was discharged with a referral to an outpatient program. I was lucky to have great health insurance coverage as a graduate student at Yale University. I tried to form relationships with others in recovery. But every person in early recovery that I became close with relapsed during the time that I knew them. Why is recovery so difficult, especially in the beginning? Brain imaging of AUD patients has shown that fewer days of abstinence is associated with a greater disruption of brain activity, and that with each added day of abstinence, brain functioning improves. After more than 13 years of sobriety, I still wonder about my success. I was one of the lucky few who decided to quit and never relapsed. Of course, I will never know how my brain's activity was altered during my years of drinking and early abstinence. But if I ever hear about a study that is seeking to scan the brains of recovered AUD patients with long-term sobriety, I would certainly be tempted to sign up. And up next, we have Kylie Renee Wolf. Thanks, Lisa. Next, I'll be reading a condensed version of my piece titled, How Fire Left Its Mark on the Smoky Mountain Landscape, a Five-Year Reflection. Fire is an unrelenting force. When controlled, it represents strength and power. When wild, it leaves behind visible scars. The latter is what the Great Smoky Mountains National Park landscape and community witnessed in recent years. Time provides space to heal, but despite nature's attempts to renew, tangible evidence of tragedy remains. Five years ago, the Chimney Tops 2 fire ravaged approximately 11,000 acres of the park's wooded landscape. It spilled out of the park and pulled the town of Gatlinburg, Tennessee into its grasp. 14 people died and approximately 2,500 homes and buildings were either destroyed or damaged outside park boundaries. In May, my fiance and I traveled to Great Smoky to hike Mount LeConte, the park's third highest peak and stay at the LeConte Lodge, a series of rustic cabins constructed in 1926. At first, our surroundings appeared beautifully undisturbed, but as our shoes crunched fine gravel and traversed uneven rocks along the Rainbow Falls Trail, signs of the wildfire came into view. After we reached the trail's namesake, an 80-foot waterfall, we approached an exposed section warmed by the summer sun. Surrounded by burnt trees, we were standing right where the flames of the largest fire in Great Smoky Mountains National Park history once blazed. Stunted trees, shadows of their former selves, maintained a darkened outer layer. Below those blackened skeletons, hundreds of healthy plants had erupted from the soil. Shades of green contrasted with the charred remnants of above as leafless, frail branches protruded in all directions. There are certain forest types, especially forest types dominated by pine and oak that are dependent on fire, said Rob Klein, fire ecologist for the National Park Service. The species that occupy those forest communities are also dependent on that disturbance, he added. With more than 19,000 species identified and documented, the park that lays rumpled along the mountainous Tennessee-North Carolina border is considered the country's most biodiverse park. 
at least a dozen of its flora and fauna benefit from regular fires. Immediately after chimney tops too, wild turkeys were seen scratching for food in the soil. Since then, black bear, white-tailed deer, and other mammals have returned to source acorns from the regenerating forest. Ash acting as fertilizer has also prompted the regrowth of mountain laurel and jewelweed in burned areas. And most, but most notably, the fire prompted the resin sealed cones of table mountain pine trees to open and release seeds. Days after the fire, several of us walked up one of the trails where there was a particu particularly large table mountain pine stand, said Klein. As we stood there, we started to notice things fluttering through the air. When we followed one of them to the ground, it was a table mountain pine seed coming out of a freshly opened cone. They were falling across the landscape. He compared the seeds to tiny helicopters and said, it's clear five years later that some areas of the park are going to become pine forest again. It's just a matter of time. Half a decade removed, what had been lost to the chimney tops two flames is coming back to life. The forest floor blooming again beneath dense thickets of pine and oak. Even though the flames of the fire were uncontrolled, these species are regaining control of their future. When my fiance and I reached our destination, six and a half miles up the trail, we settled amidst the warm glow of the lodge's old timey kerosene lamp. The next morning, we hiked almost three quarters of a mile to Myrtle Point, a coveted sunrise spot. Unobstructed, our view changed by the minute as streaks of orange and yellow filled the morning sky. The sun crested the tree-lined mountaintops, marking the start of a new day. Nature had prevailed, and with time, the Smoky Mountain community can find hope in the surrounding landscape too. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our next reader, Laura Decker. Hi, I'm going to be reading about a simpler approach to saving the planet. Eric Asadorian thinks a lot about consumption. As a senior fellow at World Watch Institute, he studied things like consumerism, ethics, and sustainable communities. He's become convinced that humanity's best and possibly only hope lies in drastically reducing consumption. So a couple of years ago, Asadorian and his family left their apartment in Washington DC's vibrant Logan Circle neighborhood and moved to the bucolic countryside of Middletown, Connecticut, where they began living a more sustainable lifestyle. In Middletown, Asadorian takes martial arts classes with his son, Aylan. The class provides exercise, father-son bonding, and a welcoming community. He says he has much more free time since the move, and the lower cost of living allows him a better work-life balance. I average maybe 25 to 30 hours of work a week. I don't want to work more than that. It's also good because it limits my income, which means I consume less. Asadorian has written extensively about how consumerism became the world's dominant cultural paradigm. People in the US accounted for $17.5 trillion of consumption in 2019. And as Asadorian noted, if everyone lived like Americans, Earth could sustain only 1.4 billion people. He believes a complete cultural transformation is necessary. The science is pretty clear, he says. We have to make radical changes. Now, Asadorian is sitting in the dappled shade outside of Middletown's public library. It's just a short bike ride from his home, and he sometimes works there while his son goes to outdoor school. He says, on Tuesdays, Aylan spends six hours in the woods with forest mentors. They did a little foraging yesterday and found a bunch of chicken of the woods that I cooked last night. A 2012 World Watch report argues that climate change, while potentially catastrophic, isn't the only negative consequence of our ever increasing consumption. It also lists air pollution, soil erosion, obesity, and time stress among many others. Asadorian says, we're held in this system of consuming more and more, even when it makes us fat and sick and tired and overworked. His first inkling of a rampant consumer culture came from a high school job with a moving company where he was overwhelmed by the sheer volume. The sharp contrast he saw during a college trip to India 
was even harder to process. He says, I went to Bangalore and I saw poverty. And when I came back, I had what anthropologists call reverse culture shock, struggling to feel sane as I walked through a grocery store. He channeled that awakening by volunteering with an environmental group. That led to an internship and eventual career at Worldwatch, where he began to ask, how do we normalize a low consumption lifestyle? He knows that not everyone is ready to completely refigure their lives and that it will take conscious effort to transform a culture that values acquisition into one that prioritizes well being. But he thinks we have an opportunity in the midst of crisis to design a better post consumer future. He says, People are focused on the climate collapse and the immediate consequences. I'm taking the long view more. We can sow the seeds of an earth nurturing instead of earth ravaging future. Not only can we increase our odds, but we can also find new purpose. Thank you. Now joining us from Chicago is Genevieve Joan DeFour Allen, reading an excerpt from Pestin Show. Thank you, Laura. Um, I'll get right into it. Albuquerque is a city of ditches and acequias, a veritable Venice of the desert, which is fantastic for the local muskrats. Wetlands and waterways are their natural habitats. Even in the semi-arid southwest and urban environments, they thrive as long as there's water. They survive brackish water, coal waste water, ditch water, and stagnant pond water. They conquer all water except maybe the ocean. Even industrial rivers with shores of concrete and plastic clogged eddies are no trouble. Muskrats find a way. They have adapted to both worlds, wild and man-made. And like many people, muskrats are also protective of their property. Adult males mark their territory with a unique musk, which is produced from their scent glands during breeding season. When their territory is encroached by another male, the land-holding muskrat enters the water and splashes like mad. The scene is somehow familiar. A grizzled muskrat, alerted by ripples of scent, plops into his pond toward the interloper, communicating in splish-splash language, get off my pond. If the property-holding muskrat is also lucky enough to attract a female, they move in together quickly. The couples work together to build mounds of mud and vegetation before the first winter frosts. When possible, they make their mounds in the middle of a body of water to avoid land-based predators. While they're pushing up the mud, the muskrats incorporate edible vegetation like cattails and grasses. This turns out to be a brilliant move. The vegetation helps not only with insulation, but also midwinter snacks. Muskrats are hip to well-stocked winter pantries. For a time, I too lived and grew up surrounded by mud. My family has lived for three generations in a traditional adobe home built by my grandparents in Albuquerque. Adobe bricks are made with a thick clay-like mud mixed with straw. The walls are more than a foot thick. Vigas, which are peeled and untreated logs, cross the ceiling. The general principle is not entirely dissimilar from a muskrat's mud and grass mound. And in one of his journals, Thoreau once observed, I saw a muskrat come out of a hole in the ice. While I'm looking at him, I am thinking what he is thinking of me. He is a different sort of man, that's all. The existence of this unexpectedly large rodent thriving in cities still surprises me. With their fearsome resilience and adaptability, these pests defy our best efforts to get away from them. Surrounded as I am by reminders of civilization, sirens, bus brakes, jackhammers, bike speakers, and the hub of, hum of the subway, the urban muskrat reminds me that the space we occupy is a tiny slice of a much bigger ecosystem. And in our concrete fortresses, that little wild nature still clings tenaciously. For the muskrat, much like us, they find what they need wherever they are. There's grass and water and cattails, 
There's sun on the sleek fur. There's warmth in winter's mound. Despite everything, the muskrat motors along. And next we have our short intermission. Hello again and welcome back from intermission. We are um, going to resume our readings in a minute, but um, during intermission, I had a chance to scroll through our list of attendees. We have such a great crowd here. Um, it's wonderful to see uh, such interest. And I just want to share, I'm delighted to see so many faculty members joining us. And um, also I'm honored to see that a very special faculty member from the MA in writing program has popped in, um, Ed Perlman. And I'm just um, like to make a shout out for Ed's contribution to our program as a sort of shadow uh, poetry consultant. As it turns out, quite a few science writing students this semester included poetry in their theses, um, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not a poet, <laughs> and um, so I turned to Ed, who was so gracious to um, provide some wonderful um, guidance to um, several students on their poetry. So thank you, Ed. You've really um, been uh, delivered such brilliant advice to these students. Uh, so without further ado, we will resume our readings and the um, next writer up is Hannah Bittiello. Hannah. Yeah. Hi. Um, so yeah, just wanted to second what Melissa was saying. I was one of the people who put poetry in my thesis. So thank you, Ed, for looking over my, my poetry. I'm not reading a poem this evening. I'm actually reading an excerpt of a piece called Adding Autism to the Collection. So, rocks sparkle from every corner of my room. They spill over bookshelves and crowd along the window ledge, sparkling in the sun. They sit on my desk in a display case and on the patio table outside, my treasured collection. Septarian concretion sphere collected in 2017. Crystal rock gem, all synonyms, each is made of minerals. A mass of rocks fused together makes a concretion. People used to tell me that it's hard for me to make friends because of all the walls I put up, that I'd build spikes and steels around my soft parts over time. But I'm more like a septarian concretion, a slice of septarian reveals crystals in the center, often yellow calcite, a soft waxy rock, surrounded by angular layers of silver, black, and brown. It looks like one multicolored rock, but in truth, each color represents a different mineral that has come together to create this concretion. Certain geologists think that septarian concretions are formed from the inside out. They thought that the septarian started as a small central element and would grow outward layer by layer. Sedimentary minerals would fuse into a mass of stone with a lightning bolt of crystal buried inside. Others say that the septarian forms the opposite way. A swirling cement of minerals presses in on the calcite core from every side. They squeeze and crack and harden. Calcite is a soft stone, but it survives and becomes part of this mix of crystals that we call a concretion. To survive a world that is loud, confusing, and overwhelming, autistic people mask behavior to blend in with neurotypicals. The need to hide a piece of our identity has led to a higher frequency of anxiety, depression, and eating disorders. If we don't press ourselves into a shape the neurotypical world likes, they do it for us. We become concretions, an inner world fragmented by external expectations. There's a certain way to speak and act, a way to interact with the world that most people don't have to think about. They respond instinctively to their circumstances. Meanwhile, it takes conscious effort for me to decide what I will say and how I will act to appear normal. A 2019 study published in Psychiatria Polska found that AFAB, assigned female at birth, individuals with autism like me usually go undiagnosed or misdiagnosed until much later in life. Doctors, teachers, and parents look for autism less closely in girls because it's seen as a mostly male condition. Diagnostic assessments are based on signs of autism in boys. And even those assessments are often outdated and incomplete. Progress is happening, but slowly. In the meantime, many autistic people slip through the cracks and grow up without knowing a crucial piece of their identity. It takes a lot of work to look neurotypical, but I guess I fooled everyone, even myself, until age 22. 
My doctors and teachers never noticed that anything was different about me. Maybe I was a bit quiet, but I never caused trouble in class and my grades were consistently high. My mom occasionally asked my teachers if they thought anything was off about me. They simply shook their heads and said I was a delight to have in class. Plus, I seemed to get along well with others. I couldn't possibly be autistic. By high school, I had developed a bland but universally acceptable personality, which allowed me to pass through with none of the usual teen drama. It became difficult to tell what was truly me and what had been fused onto my core. Is the septarian concretion one rock or several? And now I would like to introduce Cossack Data. Thank you, Hannah. That was wonderful. First, just a bit of background. I once drove my father-in-law from his home in our city in India, Kolkata, to the holy river, Ganga, which marks the city's western border. This unscheduled trip was due to somber circumstances, a death in the family. This excerpt from my essay, Dust, is a vignette from that day. When his older brother suddenly passed away, my father-in-law flew out to the departed gentleman's hometown to participate in the final rites. The body was cremated according to Hindu rituals. My father-in-law returned bearing the cremated remains, which would be sprinkled onto the water of Ganga. In Hindu mythology, the river Ganga embodies the sacredness of all holy waters. Its name is invoked during Hindu religious rituals. And to the devout, Ganga water is considered both pure and purifying. Ritual sprinkling of the cremated remains of the deceased onto the river is believed to cleanse their soul and facilitate their journey into the light. At the river, my father-in-law said, you don't have to park, just wait in the car. I shouldn't be long. No, no, I protested. I shall come with. We walked into one of the entrances to the embankment. There were paved steps descending into the water. My mind was weighed down by the gravity of the duty my father-in-law had come to discharge. In a way, the family had entrusted to him his brother's spiritual well-being in the afterlife. Surely a huge responsibility, right? If the duty were mine, how would I even know what to do? How does one sprinkle the remains? Does one throw everything in at one go with a flick of the wrist or sprinkle on the water like salt? Here, hold this for a second. My spiraling thoughts collapsed at the voice of my father-in-law who handed me a brown paper bag. I need to wash my hands with Ganga water before I take the contents out. Approaching the steps with great solemnity, he shed his shoes, walked barefoot down the steps into the water, and bending down, rinsed his palms thoroughly before reaching out to me for the brown paper bag. He took out a piece of folded paper, not larger than a one-ounce box of sun-made California resins. Carefully, he opened the folds to peek inside and then folded it back, but not before I caught a glimpse of the cremated remains. I didn't know what I was expecting. Movies and sitcoms always show an arm filled with ash, the accidental release of the ash from the container forming a powdery cloud is a humorous trope. This was nothing like that. Within the folds of paper that my father-in-law held with reverence, there were bits of grayish ash, some flakes, some powdered, and a few pieces of charred bones not larger than a well-chewed chicken wing. That was it. As my father-in-law started to set the folded paper with the remains gently down on the water surface, I remembered my mother's admonishment from earlier that morning. For the ritual with which you are helping your father-in-law, 
this is the right way she had instructed me maintain a touch with him at all times especially when his feet are submerged we believe this prevents the living from inadvertently floating away with the remains of the dead from atop a concrete mule i placed a palm on his shoulder the piece of paper bobbed up and down a few times as it floated away and quickly drowned when it got wet thank you and now it's my pleasure to introduce margaret gregory all right thank you kasik um i'm going to be reading an excerpt of a personal essay called 15 miles at golden hour Sunset slants off Ponderosa's in the late February evening. Deep in the Pine Ridge forest, I step out of the school van and inhale. Spring fills the air. The breeze carries the smell of melting snow, blooming buds, and larger than life promises. The temperature rarely tops 70 degrees during a high plains winter. So when it does, we celebrate. Today, my college cross country team's celebration is a long run, starting on gravel roads, transitioning the highway and ending at campus. Coach dropped off my teammates for their distances, nine, 10, 11 miles from campus. I ride the van to the end of the line, 15 miles from our destination. I'm not sure my legs can handle it, but I choose to believe the promises blown in by the wind. The van spits rocks at me as coach drives back to college. As I begin the run, acid burbles in my stomach. Traitorous thoughts disrupt my flow. What if I can't make it? What if I die out here and my corpse is eaten by coyotes? But soon I settle into a familiar stride. Breathe in with right strike, out with left strike, in with right strike, out with left strike. Smooth out that hitch in your left leg, keep your elbows in tight. I turn off gravel onto pavement. My stomach drops as Job Corps Hill approaches. When I drive it, I worry my car will vault off the end into a pasture. But no fear bothers my mind as I descend. Down, 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 flying over rumble bars, cars too close for comfort. But I no longer fear death out here. This is life. In my brain, happy hormones bathe my neurons. In my stomach, euphoria neutralizes acid. As I tick off miles, my pace improves steadily. Mile four, 745. Mile five, 730. Mile six, 725, mile seven, 715. I may just be an adequate runner at a small college, but in this moment, I could be Joan Benoit Samuelson, Catherine Switzer, Shalane Flanagan. I am no longer a mind in a body. I am a body created solely to run this route. As my muscles loosen, my stride grows longer. I gobble up several feet of road with each step. I discard my shirt, one more barrier removed between me and flow. Mile eight, mile nine, mile 10, I turn on to Country Club Road, a familiar course. No surprises will shake me for the rest of this run. Flow consumes me. My vision narrows to encompass only the gravel and gold before me. I soak in the rhythm of my steps crunching on rock how they sink with my strained breathing. I soak in the sliver of sinking sunlight, saturating the spiritless landscape with scarlet and saffron. I soak in the chill of dust on my skin. When I cease this run, I will desire a jacket. The temperature plummets once the sun sets, but for now, my circulatory system dilates, sending saturated blood from the sutures of my brain to the extremities of my toes. I'd like to introduce Farron Brower next. Thank you, Margaret. 
I'll be reading from my piece, Never Too Old to Learn, Two Years at the Western Antique Airplane and Automobile Museum, and that's located in Hood River, Oregon, where I live. Before I read, though, I'd like to show you something that um, will illustrate uh, a consistent comment I hear from visitors, and that is about the discrepancy between the exterior of the museum and what they see inside. This is the museum. Without the lettering on the front, it might be a building in a light industrial park. And this is what visitors see inside as they enter from the lobby. That's a one and a half acre aircraft hangar. And this is a closer view of some of the airplanes that are displayed there. Every Thursday morning from 8.30 till nine, the, the Western Antique Airplane and Automobile Museum is mine, if only because I don't have to share it with anyone. Uh, a few volunteers and the museum's founder gather around the table in the lobby for coffee. I sometimes join them, but only for a few minutes because I can't linger. My record time for turning on the 47 overhead lights and 17 video monitors is 21 minutes. And yes, I have counted all of them. So I buzz around on a three wheeled electric scooter and make the rounds in time to greet the first visitors, some of whom show up five minutes after the museum opens. When I started volunteering in June 2019, I knew far more about commercial airline jets than pre-war wood and fabric biplanes. I credit curiosity and the determination to get the facts right by learning from my peers and from visitors and others who have firsthand knowledge from owning and flying these airplanes. I soon discovered that knowing about visitors was as important as learning about antique airplanes. Visitors have tells, as card gamblers say, nonverbal cues that suggest how they will engage with a docent or sometimes not. When I approach a visitor, I respect their personal space, which for Americans is about four or five feet. I ask a few routine questions that don't require committing to a conversation. Is this your first time at the museum? Where are you from? And even in those brief responses, I can spot the tells. Body language, do they turn to face me? Tone of voice, pleasant, engaging, or flat? The ideal response is a question from the visitor. Is it true that all these planes all still fly? That is true. They all are flyable. Others include what are the sources of the aircraft, whether they're donated or loaned, and when the museum opened. That was in uh, 2014. But the question really doesn't matter. Just asking means that the visitor is curious and welcomes the chance to ask a reliable source. One of the least impressive but most important aircraft in the collection is a replica of the 1902 Wright glider that hangs above the Wright exhibit. A few visitors who notice the airplane over their heads glance at it and move on unless I get their attention and explain how every aircraft in the collection is directly descended from this glider. I point out that the Wrights not only mastered sustained controlled flight, but also taught themselves to fly without a serious mishap. Thank you. I would like to introduce, there it is, Megan Ewald. Great, thanks so much. I am, you're gonna see me? Great. Thanks so much, Farron. I'm gonna be reading the introduction to a piece called Baltimore's Bee Wrangler, which is about an urban beekeeper who has relocated over hundred bee colonies to Baltimore City. Anna Baudry was drinking a cup of tea when the bees descended. She heard them first, thousands of yellow insects buzzing outside the window of her second story Washington DC apartment. Soon bees were crawling through the AC vents. They whizzed chaotically through her 500 square foot apartment, bumping against the ceiling and circling Baudry's head. Outside, the bees began to funnel themselves through a tiny hole in the concrete windowsill and into the drywall. Within five minutes, she could hear the colony buzzing inside the wall, vibrating like an engine trapped in the space beneath her bedroom window. But the bees weren't attacking, they were swarming. While frantically sealing her AC vents with blue painter's tape, what we called the DC Beekeepers Alliance. They put her in touch with Bill Castro, a bee removal specialist and an urban beekeeper based in Baltimore, Maryland. 
He showed up a few days later like a real life ghostbuster, removing a chunk of drywall and slowly sucking the bees up with a specialized vacuum. A middle-aged man with shaggy hair and rectangular glasses, Castro chatted cheerfully with Anna while removing honeycomb from the wall. Tucking the waxy comb into a wooden beehive, he ensured the bees had everything they needed for their new home. Within a few hours, the bees were gone and Castro had patched the drywall so well that we could hardly see a scar. She just witnessed the work of an urban bee wrangler. The science of swarms. Swarming is how colonies of honeybees replicate. It generally happens in the springtime when flowers are blooming and there's ample nectar for bees to forage. The mated queen bee, the only honeybee capable of laying eggs, will lay up to 20 virgin queens in individual honeycomb. As the virgin queens prepare to emerge, straining against the walls of their cells, the mated queen flies away with half the colony's population. There can only be one queen, so she, so she escapes before the bloodbath can ensue. The virgin queens that emerge at the same time fight to the death, clawing and stinging each other, destroying the unhatched virgin queen cells until only one queen bee remains. Then the victorious queen will fly out on what is called a nuptial flight, circle back to the hive, mate with up to 20 males, and start laying eggs. The original colony is reborn with a new queen. Meanwhile, the original queen and her loyal swarm fly off in search of a new home, traveling in a close formation, so synchronous they appear almost liquid. The swarm can travel several miles before they find a suitable location. While bees historically settle in tree cavities, some bees are now thoroughly urban insects. It's not unusual for bees to, to swarm from one house and into another. Mid-Atlantic cities like Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, with their many old and historic homes, provide ample habitat for homeless honeybees. However, with a little effort, urban beekeepers like Bill Castro believe it's possible for humans and bees to live side by side. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Barbara Hirsch with Decisions, Navigating the Valley Between Life and Death. Thanks, Megan. Um, this is an excerpt, the first section of a personal essay. The rhythm of the young woman's heart skipped across the bedside monitor, offering reassurance, but the sallowness of her face and arms suggested she was hemorrhaging. Most of her body was hidden under a white sheet as she lay in the recovery area after a surgery she had put off for months. A trinity of narrow tubing lying side by side provided sustenance, nutrient-rich fluid, oxygen, and medication to support the most basic life functions. Empty vials, syringes, and blood tubes sat in the shadowed valley between the woman's ankles. It wasn't the safest place to store supplies, but time was running out for this woman and the nurses needed quick access to their resources. Just inches from that little valley, I stood at the foot of the bed the only place for me to stay out of the way among the assembly of the six nurses and physicians trying to save this woman's life. I wasn't a member of the clinical team, but the anesthesiologists had asked me for help. I had to make a decision. A nurse pulled back the white sheet and lifted the woman's hospital gown. I caught a glimpse of an abdominal bandage drenched to a deep crimson. Another nurse drew blood samples from an arterial line a special catheter inserted into the patient's arm. Initially, this line was intended to monitor the patient's blood pressure and oxygenation, but now it acted as a mini pipeline for the nurses to frequently access and check all her blood values, hemoglobin, hematocrit, platelets, and clotting times. A third nurse handled grenade-shaped drains protruding from under the young woman's abdominal bandage. No sooner had the nurse emptied one then it expanded again with its bright red contents. Five intravenous bags were hanging on poles, three on the left side and two on the right. Some delivered medications to keep the patient's blood pressure stable and others infused electrolytes and glucose into the blood of the young woman who was still unconscious and unable to receive anything by mouth. One of the nurses called out lab results, remarking that the woman's blood volume was dropping despite the infusion of rescue IV fluid. I was there as a lawyer, but based on my previous experience as a nurse, I knew what was going on. This young woman was bleeding to death. I stood perfectly still 
fearful that somehow my movement would upset the rhythm of the team attending to the young woman. The patient was deteriorating in front of me and her team was waiting for my legal opinion, but I couldn't speak. Come on, Barbara, snap out of it, I told myself. Her life is in your hands. The VP of critical care nursing had walked into my office just 30 minutes before. She snapped orders so quickly, I didn't have time to think about what might lie ahead. Come with me, she commanded. They need us in recovery. She walked away before I could stand up. I grabbed the first blank piece of paper on my desk and a pen and scrambled to follow her. Although I was a foot taller than the VP, I struggled to keep up with her stride. Along the way, she filled me in. We have a 27 year old woman who was admitted for a myomectomy. The surgical procedure would remove uterine fibroids, non-cancerous growths that could cause severe pain and bleeding. I paused at the mention of the patient's age. She sounded too young to be at the center of a critical situation, one that a VP would call the hospital attorney for. But then the VP explained. The surgeon removed three large fibroids from the woman's uterus. She's bleeding like a pig and she's a Jehovah's Witness. And next I'd like to introduce my fellow science writer, Will Kusinski, who's joining us right outside of Pittsburgh. Will? Thank you, Barbara. Uh, I'm reading the introduction for my piece called Conservation Collateral. Conservation Collateral, anti-poaching efforts in the Congo and the decline of the Baca. During Cameroon's rainy seasons, the rapids of the Nogoko River serve as a deterrent for poachers trying to enter the Jaw Biosphere Reserve. But in the dry seasons, the river wanes and its placid brown waters allow poachers access to remote parts of one of the largest and best preserved protected rainforests in Africa. The ferryman pushes his pole into the riverbed and the small flat bottom punt drifts from the bank. It is a slow, quiet affair, and many members of our expedition begin to sweat under the morning sun. Despite the captivating sight of the Congo Basin's transition forest and its towering ebony, mahogany, and ficus trees, my eyes rest on the man slashing contrapposto at the boat's aft. More specifically, on the Belgian FN Scar H battle rifle slung across his chest. The automatic weapons were issued by Cameroon's Ministry of Forests and Wildlife to its EcoGuard Ranger Force in 2015 after an increase in deadly encounters with poachers equipped with Kalashnikovs. The modern rifle sticks out in stark contrast to the rural backwater village of Somolomo, but it doesn't alarm me. What I feel is more of an acute awareness of its closeness. I see it and the illegal poaching it is intended to thwart as an unfortunate inevitability of West Central Africa and a warning to those intending to harm us or the environment. We are in the Southeast of Cameroon during the dry season in January of 2020, cautiously, maybe even naively, navigating through a country beset by conflict. Hostilities between the French speaking government and Anglophone separatists in the Northwest and Southwest are intensifying. Boko Haram jihadists are killing hundreds of civilians in the far North region. Pirates along the country's west coast land in port cities to conduct raids and kidnappings. Frankly, us being a group of mostly white Western graduate students is itself enough to garner bewildered stares from Cameroonians outside of the capital of Yaoundé. Cameroon, like the rest of Africa, still simmers with post-colonial tension. It is an interesting choice of location for a training course in conservation field work. Yet our destination, the Boromir Research Station, deep within the Jaw Biosphere Reserve in the country's southeast corner, seems insulated from conflict, maybe because of the physical nature of the environment. The Jaw marks the upper right-hand edge of the Congo Basin and makes up one-third of the tri-national Jaw Odzala Makebi Forest, which is co-managed by Cameroon, Gabon, and the Republic of the Congo. In a similar fashion, the Boomer Research Station is managed by the Congo Basin Institute, a partner between UC, partnership between UCLA and the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. The encampment is remote and the surrounding rainforest runs thick. Beyond the countless reptile, amphibian, bird, insect, and plant inhabitants, 
The Congo Basin is home to lowland gorillas, forest elephants, and several species of scaly pangolin. It is also the ancestral land of the marginalized Baka people, an ethnic group historically and pejoratively referred to as the pygmies. We reach the shoreline and disembark. I turn back to the ferryman and wave, knowing that his boat is the last form of tra passive transportation I'll encounter for the next 10 days. From here, it's a 30 kilometer hike to Buramir Station in the heart of the Jaw. In coming here, I'm fulfilling a lifelong dream of seeing Central Africa off the beaten path, of experiencing the environment from outside of the boundaries of a safari vehicle. There's an undeniable sense of adventure to the exp expedition, and I'd wager that I'm not the only member of our party that feels it. Despite my inexperience, or perhaps partly because of it, I feel bathed in rugged responsibility heading into this unknown, trekking through elephant tracks underneath the emerald, emerald canopy with nothing but a hiking pack. I look back one last time and see the ferry drifting away. Here is where I start to lose focus of the environment and field training and begin to understand the deeper struggles of the jaw, not just the desperate challenges facing its plants and animals, but its human inhabitants as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Will, and thank you to all of our readers. These were just wonderful. I, I just feel so privileged to have been your host for the evening and to um, have heard all of your thesis works uh, represented here. You do us proud, and we're all giving you a virtual Zoom applause, I am sure. Um, we have one more item on the agenda for today, which is the presentation of the David Everett Award. And I would like to, if I can, without technically messing up here, um, share an image of uh, David. It's actually an image of several folks, um, which is intentional uh, because David, um, that is David with, and I hope you are seeing the complete picture, um, that is David with students uh, at a thesis reading actually uh, taken several years ago. David is the distinguished gentleman on the right and um, we lost David almost two years ago, uh, but I, I really wanted to show this photo. Many of you did not know David, um, but he was our wonderful program director and just so um, full of life and passion for literature and um, was just um, an exhilarating uh, teacher and never happier than when he was with students. Um, so this might just give you a little, little snippet of that if you did not know David. And um, so I am going to um, announce the winner of our award and I'm going to ask Sam to help me as well. Um, but first I want to tell you just a little bit about this award. The David Everett Award is given annually to a graduating MA in writing or science writing student who is recognized by the faculty as having an outstanding thesis with promising prospects for publication. The award was created in 2020 to honor the memory of David Everett, who championed the work of aspiring writers during his decades directing the Hopkins uh, writing program and it is to be presented at the December thesis reading where we are. Um, we've decided to give the award in alternating years to a student in the MA in writing program and um, MA in science writing program. Last year, the inaugural year, the award was given to MA in writing student, Jessica Harper. And this year the award is designated for a science writing student. But in fact, making these selections is incredibly difficult. Um, uh, we have so many exceptional writers in our program and um, faculty nominated many um, 
many wonderful um, students um, and theses. Uh, so that in the end this year, we decided uh, that the David Everett Award should go to two students whose writing and reporting uh, really would have impressed David. And uh, so, and I also have to say, if I were David, who was really a maestro at emceeing these events, I would now draw out this proceeding and keep everybody in suspense for a little while longer and tell some jokes along the way. But uh, not having such talents, I'll just proceed and tell you that I am uh, thoroughly delighted to present one of our two awards to Barbara Hirsch. And let me tell you a little bit about Barbara. Um, and this statement will come from um, one of the faculty members who um, has uh, nominated her. Barbara Hirsch was a student in my class several years ago, and I was impressed with her talent, professionalism, and determination to improve as a writer. Fast forward to this semester, when I was asked to review the final draft of her thesis. I expected it to be top notch, and it was. But what really turned my head was her essay about her son's struggle with schizophrenia. Entitled, My Journey Back to Normal, the piece works on so many levels. The first person voice helps the reader understand the science and what's at stake. Just as importantly, it details a compelling story and the impact this diagnosis had upon the family, as well as the narrator. At its best, ours is a program where students improve often markedly, and in doing so, they find a new role in the world. The best writers sometimes take on life's disorder and bring a degree of understanding, even insight to such chaos. That's what Barbara has done during her time at JHU. So congratulations, hearty congratulations, Barbara, on um, receiving this award most deservedly. And David Everett truly would have been proud of your work. And um, to present the second award, I'm going to invite Sam Apple back um, to share a little bit about this writer. Sure. Thanks, Melissa. Our other winner this evening is William Kosinski. And um, I'm going to read a little bit, uh, a few of the words um, shared by one of uh, William's professors. Against the unknown, William's thesis is that difficult combination to pull off, allowing personal curiosity to drive a science investigation that through his reporting and storytelling, becomes something you're excited to read, even though you might not have cared about the subject before. He does a great job of approaching science head on and then exploring it in accessible lay terms, and he superbly weaves his own life and perspective into his pieces. Great writing, great thinking, and a great example of how scientific understanding shapes perception. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with uh, Will myself uh, during my first semester here, and I, I can second every word of that. And uh, I'm so delighted uh, to see Will uh, share this David Everett Award. And, and congrats to both of you and to all the readers tonight who were absolutely fantastic. Here, here. Yes, you, you were wonderful um, readers. And congratulations to Barb and to Will on this honor. And congratulations to all of our readers and all of our thesis students. You've um, this has been a delightful evening. You've enlightened us. You've made us laugh. You've maybe made us uh, shed a tear, and um, it's been a most enjoyable evening. Um, so, and thank you all for attending. Thesis readers, please stick around for a minute so we can do. Um, a little snap a little photo of you all on the screen. So if I could have one more moment of your time, but to everybody else, have a have a wonderful evening and thank you again for attending. <laughs>